was taken from the scrapyard by rail. The diesel shunted him into a lonely siding at Blindbearer Station. Dai was uncoupled and left all alone in the siding. Rusted relics of the Steam Age lay derelict and forgotten, and it made Dai wonder just how long had he really been in the scrapyard. It started to rain, and Dai watched as a freight train rumbled slowly through, tooting a single horn at him. He felt cold and alone. Welcome to Wales again! <laughs> Soon, Di heard a noise, and a little maroon diesel came into view. Leslie, the Class 03 diesel, had just arrived from Land Deer Dog to collect him. He brought Mr. Davies and the Board of Directors with him. Excellent! Here he is, gentlemen. Here's your surprise. Is this it? Yes, Mr. Bruce. Indeed it is. What's wrong, Mr. Bruce? I am confused as to how we can afford this engine, Mr. Davies. It's a wreck. How can we afford to overhaul a mainline locomotive? We already have a steam engine. And I don't even have a workshop. And also, I didn't approve any expenditure. How on earth did you get it here? Ah, well, yes, you see. I might have slightly bought this engine myself. Wait, what? You bought an engine yourself? Without telling the board. Why didn't you oh, let God, any no, of us know about this? What the hell is going on? Why did you tell me about this team effort? effort? I thought, I thought this was meant to be a team effort, Mr. Davies. Whoa, whoa, gentlemen, please let me explain. I've bought this engine myself with my own money. That's why you were not informed about expenditure, Mr. Bruce. Die here, as I have named him, is my own locomotive. I have bought him to help get this railway company going. And I'll have you know that his boiler is in very good condition, so I believe only a light overhaul will be necessary to get him running again. The board of directors felt guilty about their outburst. I'm sorry we shouted at you, Mr. Davis, but why didn't you tell us? Well, I don't like the public to know my own personal affairs, Mr. Edmondson. Plus, I had to get him here first. Now, enough dilly-dallying, gentlemen. We've got no time to lose. We're out on the main line, after all. Are you ready to move, Di? Only just, sir. We had to stop three times to grease my motion. Then I ran a hotbox just outside of Newport. That's a shame, but at least you're here now. We're going to grease you up again and then get you back to land, dear dog. We've got some engineers waiting for you. Just then, a strange figure came across the tracks. It was the signalman, and he had been watching the gentleman holding up the main line. Oi! Get a move on, will you? You're blocking the main line. I've gone express to you any minute. Oh, my word. I am so sorry, Mr. Signalman. We were distracted. You don't say. Now get a thumping move on. Leslie was coupled up to Di, and he pulled with all his might to get Di moving. Dai's motion groaned and cracked as it accelerated into motion once again, allowing the grease and oil to work its way into every joint. They headed across the main line, passing underneath the Blind Barris Ale Brewery, which was built directly above the South Wales main line. The signalman hastily set the points as they passed, ready for the incoming express train. They emerged from the tunnel and came to a standstill just as they reached the branch line. What's up? We're on the branch line now. We have to put the stop boards back and collect the token from the signalman. The signalman wasn't happy to see them again. Here's your token. Be on your way. And on that note, Leslie pulled hard and dragged Di up the short incline towards Penoyf Junction. Here, they made their way underneath the South Wales main line and headed eastwards. It was a long, slow journey, but despite the bad weather, Di was amazed by his new surroundings. Soon, they had left the main line and passed through Penoyf Junction. 
Look at that castle. That's known as Fully Tower, Di. It was once owned by Lord Pickley, the Duke of Penwith. It's a ruin now. Leslie pulled hard against the gradient to keep Di rolling. They headed across the viaduct and into a tunnel, and emerged in the Penoy Valley. As they rolled through Blindcoid Station, Di began to understand exactly how derelict the line was. Here they stopped again to check the grease and oil. Some of the local villagers came to the station to inspect Di. The cavalcade started again, and soon they passed through the run-down remains of a colliery. Ooh, that's Penny on Colliery! This is where I used to work! They soon passed through Pennyog Station. Here, the gradient steepened to a fierce 1 in 39 as they headed up into the high mountain plateaus of the Pennoy Valley. Di hadn't seen such breathtaking scenery for a long time and suddenly felt very warm inside. It reminded him of his previous home on the Somerset and Dorset line. They passed Nantiglin Reservoir, but soon Mr. Davies had called them to a stop near an old country cottage. Mr. Davies, why have we stopped? Is there a problem? No, no there's no problem. This is my house, you see. I forgot my lunchbox this morning. There you are, William. I thought you would never come. (laughs) Being general manager must give you some privileges, I suppose. Mr. Davies brought Victoria down the line to show her die. Well, he's here. We've got him here at last. I still cannot believe you actually paid for that thing. Hey, come on, sweetheart. One day, soon, this engine will look as good as new. You are mad, William. You are absolutely barking mad. All of you. I love you too, sweetheart. Mr. Davies grabbed his lunchbox, gave Victoria a kiss goodbye, and soon the train started again. Leslie was not happy at having to start on such a steep slope. His engine growled fiercely as his wheels slipped as he struggled to grip the rails. Finally, after a lot of slipping, sliding and swearing, they were underway again. They headed into a tunnel and soon passed through the quiet country village of Nanty Glynn. Some of the townspeople who were supporting the railway had gathered on the platform to wish Di well on his journey to Land Deerdog. They crossed the Avonlewid River and continued along the valley. Here, Di felt the gradient level out. They had reached the summit at last, much to Leslie's relief. Soon they arrived at the halfway station of Abbasyth, where a very large crowd had gathered to see Di for the first time. We need to wait here for a while. There is a freight train coming in the opposite direction. I thought this line was closed, Mr. Davies. Yes, it is. British Railways are removing the last few wagons from the dockyard at Landier Dog before it's redeveloped. Once it has passed, we'll get the section token and we can carry on. Whilst they waited, Mr. Edmondson, the fitter, began to lubricate Dye's valve gear. As he made his rounds, he made a shocking discovery. Oh, good Jesus. Die, your frames are bloody shot. What's up, mate? Look at that. If spring breaks, well, our frames will collapse under weight at boiler. Die didn't like the sound of that. Can we fix it, Mr. Edmondson? Well, yeah. It's an easy fix to replace the own guards, but we need a lift to boiler out. We don't have a crane. I'm afraid we cannot do that, gentlemen. I only have so much money available. That only includes the cost of a very basic overhaul, I'm afraid. Anything more serious will have to wait. Well, this is pretty serious, Mr. Davies. If spring goes, then die here is addict. I see. Once you are in steam, die, we won't be able to take you out of traffic. Not until we get another engine, at least. You'll just have to live with it for now. I can try and weld it. Maybe that will help? Well, not really, but what else can we do? They had been chatting for so long that none of them had noticed that the freight train had pulled into the station just behind them. (laughs) Ha! You steamers never give up, do you? Broken horn guides, cracked frames, you don't have a chance. This line is finished, just like the rest of you steamers. 
You might as well just give up now. Why the cheeky little... Ignore him. Don't let him get to you, Thomas. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, guys. We have the token for the next section. What are we going to do, Mr. Davies? Well, there's nothing we can do, Mr. Edmondson. We have to get this railway started somehow. I just hope we can keep the service going until we get another engine to take over. Leslie was started up, and the train rolled out of Aberside Station. Di felt very nervous indeed. He didn't realise just how bad a condition he was really in. They headed eastwards, passing the old Abbasife Slate Quarry, and headed through the tunnel and into the Eastern Valley. They stopped at Ponton Moyle to check the axle boxes, and continued onwards before they were stopped out of course. Why have we stopped, Leslie? It's the cliffs. Di was confused. The what? It's the cliffs. You'll see them now. We have a speed limit here. The track work is in poor condition, so we're only allowed to go at walking pace over this section. It's the first section we need to repair when the wagons get here. Di didn't like the sound of that, but couldn't help but be impressed by the landscape. As they inched forward, Di gazed down into the ravine. He didn't feel so brave anymore. Suddenly, the track jolted, and Di felt his right side leaning over towards the river. Oh, that's mighty steep. Di closed his eyes, feeling very scared of the ravine. Soon, Leslie tooted his horn, signalling that they were clear at last. Phew, I did not like that. That bit of track is damaged. We need to repair it before we reopen the line. Don't you worry, Di. It'll be safe the next time you're here. Di didn't feel so confident. The cavalcade set off again, and soon they reached Panty Gasson, where the line splits. The line to the right takes you down to the docks, and the line to the left takes you to Lendia Dog. The engines rolled down the slope from Pantigasog and soon arrived in Landierdog. Dai was amazed by the town. It was a true seaside town. Dai gazed in disbelief that the Welsh seaside could look so charming, even on a rainy day, and wondered just what it would look like at the height of the summer season. Leslie shunted Dai onto the turntable, and he was turned around for the first time in years. He chuckled to himself as old memories came flooding back to him. <laughs> You're having fun over there. Ah, so many memories, Leslie. I remember this. Oh, it's been so long. Di was then shunted into the yard, where he met Ian for the first time. Well, Di, what do you think of our humble home? It'll look nice one day. It looks beautiful. I love it here. Hello there. You must be Di. I'm Ian. We both used to work at the colliery. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you both. I am very happy to be here. Ah, I see you've met these two. Very good. Okay, listen up, engines. Now that we have a suitable engine, we can start work on rebuilding the line. Leslie? You will be running the permanent way trains for the time being. Yes, sir. Also, I think it's time I let you all know the news. News? What news? Well, gather round, everyone, and I'll explain. The workmen all gathered around the shed. Some sat on the engine's buffer beams, but the engines didn't mind. Ladies and gentlemen of the Penoy Valley Railway Company, today has been a very good day for us. Our first mainline engine has arrived. We have a lot of work to do to get this railway ready for our open season. It's going to take a lot of work to get it right, but I have every faith in each and every one of you. We have a solid business plan in place. Our goal is to run a steam railway from Landierdog Harbour 
into the city of Blindberris. We already have an engine, some rolling stock, and enough materials to make a start on repairing the track. Mr. Edmondson, you and Mr. Dibden will set to work overhauling die here. Speed is of the essence. Right yeah, Mr. Davies. We'll do our best. Mr. Stovold, we will need a company headquarters. Do you have anywhere in mind? The station building at Landier Dog would be suitable for our office, Mr. Davies. I've cleaned it out already. Excellent. Mr. Julian and Mr. Bruce, we will need to establish a presence in the town. Perhaps some sort of market stool or shop to promote the railway to the townspeople. And how exactly do you plan on doing that? We can use me shop, of course. What? Yeah, not a problem, Mr. Davies. I'd be happy to run a railway shop. Excellent. Mr. Anthony, we need those coaches in tip-top condition for the running season. Can you do it? Not a problem, boss. Smashing. Since becoming the general manager, I have been involved in behind-the-scenes meetings with some very wealthy investors. These are people who I used to know and work with during my time in the shipping industry, and they are very important people to us right now. We have been given a deadline of August 31st, 1965, to prove to the Ministry of Transport and to our investors that we have what it takes to run a railway company. We need to prove that we can operate a commercially viable railway service on this line, whilst keeping to all the safety standards as specified in the Light Railway Act. That means, if we can, we will be given a franchise to operate on this line, and we will be given the opportunity to lease it from British Railways. For this to happen, we need capital. But from where, Mr Davies? Where will we? I'm coming to that, Mr Bruce. Where will we find the capital, you ask? These investors will also be inspecting us. They are very interested in our project, but will only invest money in us if we can prove to them beyond all reasonable doubt that we have what it takes to run a railway successfully. So, on the 31st of August 1965, we will be inspected by the railway inspectors and by our investors. By the 31st of August, we must have a fully working railway in place. Silence fell across the yard as the team soaked in the news. Finally, Mr. Dibden spoke. So, what you are saying, Mr. Davies, is that the railway will only be invested in if it passes the inspection, and we will only pass the inspection if we have capital investment. Yes, in a nutshell. It's impossible. It cannot be done. Don't be so negative, Mr. Bruce. I'm not being negative, Mr. Stovold. How can we rebuild a whole line and a mainline engine with no capital? You adapt and overcome, Mr. Bruce. This country was built on making the impossible possible. And you gentlemen are going to make it possible. We don't have a choice. If we are to succeed, then we all need to work together and make this a success. We have the tools, so let's finish the job. What do you say, gentlemen? The workmen and engines cheered. Di felt uplifted by Mr. Davies' speech, but this wasn't to last much longer. As for you, Di, Mr. Edmondson and Mr. Dibden here have a team of engineers who are going to start working on you right away. We need to get you in steam before the start of the running season. Unfortunately, because time and money are limited, we won't be able to give you as full an overhaul as I would like. Di didn't like the sound of this but he expected as much. But don't worry, Di. As long as your frames hold out, you can run the passenger service and prove that we have what it takes to run a railway. One of our investors, Mr. Hancock, owns an engine called Stephanie. She's a black five and he is looking for a new home for her. But he will only choose us if we get the franchise. Until the new engine arrives, you will carry the flag, if you will. We are all relying on you, Di. The meeting was over, and Di felt stunned. He couldn't believe that so many things could be at stake because of one engine. As Mr. Edmonton, Mr. Dibden, and the engineers set to work on his overhaul, he felt nervous. Well, Thomas, what do you make of that, then? It's a mountain to climb, Matthew. It's a real mountain to climb. 
Well, I just hope you're in good condition, as Mr. Davis seems to think you are, die. Go on, Thomas. Let's get on with it. Leslie coupled up to die and shunted him into the workshops. As the sun set that night, Dai gazed out on the calm sea of the Bristol Channel, pondering his future here on the Penoy Valley Railway. Don't worry, Dai. It'll be okay. These guys know how to look after engines. They've been very good to us. Dai didn't say anything. He didn't know what to say. He fell asleep that night, a nervous engine indeed. <laughs>